Hello and welcome to AGM and IBC Holding NV. My name is Jose and I will be your coordinator for today's event. For the duration of the call, your lines will be on listen only. However, you will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the call. This can be done by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad to register your question. If you require assistance at any point, please press star 0 and you will be connected to an operator. I will now hand you back to your host, Judith Jensen, to begin today's conference. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the general meeting of shareholders of NIBC Holding. The meeting will be conducted in Dutch. The operator will be speaking in English, as said. Everyone is in listening mode. If there is any room to ask questions, then please uh, ask your questions over the telephone. The operator will give you the floor by opening your line. If you need any assistance, press star zero. I will now give the floor to Sluimers, the chair of the supervisory board of NIBC. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to all of you to this general meeting of shareholders of NIBC. It is a very special meeting today in a very special setting. And those circumstances are less than perfect. And during this meeting, we will do everything in our power to serve you to the best of our abilities and use all technological functions. But it is a very new situation for us as well. As a chair of the supervisory board, I chair this meeting. Uh, sitting next to me, I have Mr. De Wilt, the CEO and Dijkhuizen, the CFO, and Mr. Van Riel, our CRO, Chief Risk Officer. We have a small amount of people here because of the COVID-19 crisis, so a smaller setting, and the other members of the supervisory board members and the executive committee are listening in from at a distance. We also have Ms. Janssen here. She's the secretary of the company, and I kindly ask her to make minutes of this meeting. After the minutes of this annual meeting will be uh, drafted as usual in accordance with the Dutch Corporate Governance Code, you have three months to react to the drafts. And then the minutes will be adopted by me and our secret secretary. The meeting was duly convened on 6 March 2020 and the record date was 20 March 2020. When we convened this meeting, we stated that the full agenda plus explanatory notes were made available for inspection and uh, in the manner prescribed. I will now move to slide three. And on that slide, you see a number of uh, items on the agenda that we can talk about. And those items on the agenda refer in first instance to the annual report. Now, we received questions beforehand, questions from shareholders, and we will answer those questions as and when possible. I will read out those questions, and then one of the people here will answer your questions. And if we have questions on the remuneration. Zeilefeld will answer the questions, and she is also on call. In addition, I want to emphasize that if you do have questions that do not relate to any items on the agenda, save them for the last item on the agenda, number 10, any other business. Now, various shareholders prior to this meeting have submitted questions about the Blackstone transaction. Now, the offer by Blackstone is not um, open for discussion today, and I refer to the earlier press releases issued on 25 February and 17 and 24 March. 
We can't say anything else about this offer. We simply refer to the press releases, so we won't address the item at all. If you have questions about the offer, then we will have a separate meeting. You can ask all of those questions then, and that will be meeting specifically about the Blackstone offer, and that is planned for the second half of this year. So please, may I ask for your patience here. I now move on to slide five. And that is about the technical uh, side of things. You can listen to this meeting online. We have the audio webcast and there is simultaneous translation into English for people who wish to listen to the English available on the website. So sim simultaneous translation. Right now, we have 147,513,369 ordinary shares in an IBC holdings. Those are the issued shares. And today, 122,321,127 ordinary shares are present during this meeting. And that's 82.9% of the issued share capital. I can also inform you that Ellen and Overy have received proxy for the various uh, items on the agenda. And those proxies concern 122 million. 32,037 shares. On behalf of Ellen Overy, we have Ms. Hovenau uh, present here today. Now, I uh, conclude that all formalities for duly convening this meeting have been complied with, so we can adopt valid resolutions as stated on the agenda. Slide six, then the voting instructions. You will see them on that slide. All shareholders present here received a voting form by email. The voting process will go as follows. Ask Ms. Janssen. We will ask Ms. Janssen, is there a majority vote? And the exact number of votes, pro, against, or abstentions will be published on our website afterward. So please complete your voting form and after the meeting, submit your form to Ms. Janssen so we can, we can count your vote. Did you vote in favor, against or abstain? So let's start with item one on the agenda and that is the annual report 2019. And that is the report of the managing board. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. De Wild and Mr. Dijkhuizen who will look at 2019 and we'll also give you a short update in respect of COVID-19 as communicated this morning by the bank. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. De Will. Please go ahead, Paulus. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very special day for us. Again, it is special not just because of the corona, but the world has changed. And we're now looking back at 2019. Now, looking back at 2019, we can be very uh, satisfied with the strong result. For thir the third year in a row, we have a yield that exceeds 10%. And we stayed within our goals. And we have our ratios are well over 14%. We have a strong growth of our mortgage production, our own balance sheet, but balance sheet, but also for the investors. And we made progress for uh, on the corporate side for achieving our strategy. So we, and you also saw that in our balance sheet. Now, the repositioning of our bank was a conscious choice, and we are implemented our strategy since, since 2016. So you see the development of our slide. So in Euro, we're talking about one and a half billion less. At the same time, we
Zo. En is het totale zwaartepunt van de bank niet anders geworden. U ziet ook. In... What you also see is that we have more mortgages in 2016, and it is almost half of our balance. If you look at the next page, you see that. You see that except for the loans, you see the distribution between corporate loans and total assets. So you see mortgages at 45% there. Most important on the corporate side is that there is a neat distribution and there is no majority in anything. And you see that there on the other side, we have a majority share in the portfolio, portfolio 45%. Last year, we did not only come up with great structures for our clients and financing instruments, but you probably also noticed that we put a lot of time into looking into documentation and making sure that all our files are in order for compliance reasons. And all people inside our organization, all finalize many processes along the way for clients and also on the retail side as well. We are part of society and therefore we have a responsibility to be fully compliant. And I would also like to state that it is not only an obligation, it is also embedded in our culture. We find it very important to stay close to our clients, not only in these times, but all times. And this also applies to the culture within our bank. When new colleagues come in, they take the banking oath. And we, at least one of the board members is present and we are there and it's important to us. We want to be very clear on day one when people come in and work start work with us, that they learn about our culture and how we act towards our clients. Ladies and gentlemen, looking back on 2019 is something that seems out of this time, in these times. Um, let's look at Q1 for those reasons. You probably have seen that Corona is now the talk of the town at this moment and that is what is going on and that is what we have to deal with. Also in our midterm objective, the bank has a strong position and is doing well when it comes to capital and liquidity. This page you see our capital ratio 17.7 .7 and also 3.7 billion and you see also a subdivision as to how liquidity is constructed. And over the past years, we have also been very active to manage and mitigate the risks in uh, our portfolio, so shipping, energy, and leveraged finance. And then if you look at the income side of the bank, then it is still our interest income, and they are very stable. Um, and they often ask us, what does this mean for the financial figures of this year? I can only tell you that it's way too early to tell and that has, has, makes no sense to put a number on the world that around us is changing every day. Doesn't mean that we're not acting on what goes on. Because what is the bank actually doing in practice and what does it mean that Corona has an influence on our company? The bank is in full control and we are very much determined to do what we need to do to get through this crisis. Let's take a look at three things. Of course, our people, our business and our clients. If we look at our people, first of all, first priority from the very first beginning was making sure that all our people were safe. And ever since 18 March 2020, we started with full remote working environments and we were ready for that also from an IT perspective. So not only our office in Frankfurt, London and here, etc. Everyone is working remotely from their homes and we're ready with all the technology that is required. And of course, 
a limited number of people is at the office, five to ten people max in a day, to be able to fulfill some critical functions that we prefer to do here in the office. Of course, communication has intensified and we are, of course, in touch with all our staff because we all are very aware that remote, remote working is good and it works, but it's very, very important to stay in touch with each other. Also, we have the uh, 600 euros for people to spend on work facilities at home. We, of course, forwarded that solution and we have some other methods to enable people to talk, continue to talk to each other. Then, a matter of uh, health, uh, I can tell you that we have one person that might potentially be infected with corona, one person. The symptoms are very clear and um, also three people abroad that were traveling and haven't gotten back to us yet. So this seems um, to be it and we are in full operation. This also applies to our business continuity plan that is supported by our CFO and COO. It's either that one or the other one that if anyone falls ill that we have business continuity there. And we, of course, keep track of our liquidity, um, not only savings, but also if you look at wholesale vending, um, there is no wholesale benchmarking transactions that are required. So we are, it's looking good. We are well prepared uh, for what is coming. If we look at our clients, you can imagine that all focus of our staff is now on our clients and making sure that they get through this crisis, not only looking on the credit side to extend loans or restructure them or change them, but also supporting others to find uh, grace periods, etc., or whatever is offered by the government. So we go through our portfolio one by one. So not only the corporate co uh, side, also the mortgage side, wherever we can, we will try to facilitate our clients. On the mortgage side, this means, of course, grace period for three to six months to get people through these times. On the corporate side, we see more customized solutions because that was always our focus there. And just reminding you, we don't have any payment traffic. We are not a primary bank. Um, so in these transactions that we tailor make, we find the solution there. And Again, we go through a portfolio client by client. We get in touch with each individual client and we use the toolings that we have with our partners. Uh, in this case, our partner Oak North that makes the insight into portfolios very clear and we go over them one by one. So all in all, as you can see, we are very well in control um, as to how things go. But of course, we do notice that remote working has its limitations especially when it comes to human contact. So the final two slides that I would like to look at is the corporate bank and retail bank. These actually come from the presentation of the annual figures. Uh, it was a positive year, 2019 corporate side, 3 billion. And also for 750 million reduction in portfolios in shipping and energy. Also, many initiatives in the new uh, field, fintech uh, in uh, investments, so finance receivable portfolio. As you see, we're not standing still. We continuously work to rebalance from one side to the other and to find new opportunities in the market to support our clients when it comes to very important moments in their careers. And, of course, um, Bequip was also successful in its growth. Very disciplined, as you can see, uh, when it comes to managing margin and quality instead of quali uh, quantity and volumes. And again, we notice that the customer contact that we have really helps in further restructuring and the interesting discussions we have with our clients about the future and what is required. Then, next slide. 2019 was a strong year with strong growth. And 
we were able to land 10,000 new customers or clients. Strong growth, very to the left from 11.6 to 14.1, both in the balance and portfolio with our investors. And last but not least, we are very happy with our customer satisfaction figures because happy clients, of course, are a great basis for us. Also, in times of Corona to be able to work together and, of course, by supporting them in all the uh, propositions that we have. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I would like to give the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Paulus. Good morning on my, uh, my part as well. So this general meeting of shareholders is about the annual accounts for 2019. And when you think back to the year and what the previous two speakers said, it seems a lifetime ago that we um, shared our figures in February. So I want to talk about 2019 for a brief time. And then I want to talk about COVID-19 and the effect on our business. So I would like to go to my first slide, which is slide number 13. So looking at the income statement and the uh, results for 2019, then you see a clear uh, uh, steady performance. We couldn't see, foresee at the time that the world was going to change, change tremendously. But it was a good performance. We were happy with our performance for the year 2019, especially if you look at the underlying drivers, which are incredibly important for 2020 and the years after. Let me just take you through some highlights. So the net interest income. I have a separate slide, but you clearly see that it stays at a the correct level for future developments. It's also driven specifically by the development of the portfolio. As my colleague said before me, Paulison, so you need to look at margin and not just volume. In addition, you see that our funding costs, and we definitely paid attention to this, and it uh, is effective because the costs went down, so I net interest income is around the figures that we want for 26, for 27, for 2019, 2018. F fee and commission income then, where you see a reduction, and that is something that we actually wanted to see happen. And that's important to realize two things. In 2018, we had the benefit of the sale of our portfolio. And in addition, we had a one-off transaction in respect of So we had a one-off transaction in respect of the um, HHSA. So I understand that my page numbering is slightly different. So that brings us to page 19, apparently. Anyway, but I will take you through the highlights. So the HHSA. A transaction was included in it at 70 million. And if you look at the fees, those fees are in lines, they're steady. And you also see that our OTM business on the retail side is growing. That was a strategic choice made by us a couple of years ago. And it is a paying off in 2019 investment income then. For the third year in a row, it was a strong year. And again, with 60 million, we can be very happy. It has a revaluation of the EBD and other valuations that develop positively as well. So the operating income, 537 million. Let's look at the costs. So I'll get back to those uh, costs later. Uh, management and under investment. So all in all, we have a net profit of 194 million, and that's a return of equity of 11%, as you can see. Last year, we had underlying special income. Now we have underlying special charges, roughly around 9 million, and that refers to closing our marketing activities in January. 
our market activities to be more precise. And that was at the end of the close of 2019. So let's talk about the net interest income in more detail. If you look at that, the underlying net interest income without the uh, one-off items, it's a positive development that is driven mainly by our funding costs. And we're very satisfied with that. What's important to realize that we consciously chose to use our saving and franchise on the savings and really cherish that. In January 2020, you will see a reduction on savings to 15 basis points uh, in the Netherlands and 20 in Germany. We thought it was important to get that balance and to cherish that franchise in a world that may become very volatile. We had no idea it would become volatile that quickly. And that resulted in the following. Our savings for the year 2019, 600 million from 8.9 to uh, nine in Audible, and that was an important basis for the year 2020. Operating expenses then. Last year, as I said, for the operating expenses, that you notice what you see is what you get. That is our slogan. And that cost income ratio, whether it's 44 or 42, that's less relevant. What's important, as Paula said, we are not underinvested. We invested in a number of projects such as care, and we were very active in KYC, Know Your Customers, the IMI, Anti-Money Laundering, and other projects that we completed in the year 2019. In addition, we have the IMI observations. We talked about that. So you see, we are constantly uh, investing in the regulatory uh, processes and the health of our organization. Now, we're also ab absorbing new initiatives. A couple of years ago, it was zero. But now we have 40 people, wonderful portfolio, 500 million roughly, and we're making progress there. We also started with Landex, and those startup costs are included in these figures. And then, of course, we have the reorganization of Inaudible. That brings us to the credit losses. Now, the credit loss expense, that is a world that we said slightly improved compared to the year before, but the world has changed. The trends were developing in the correct direction in 2019, looking at the ratio. It's a good starting point at the same time that we know that the world is no longer the same. That brings us to capital. Now, this is a very extensive charge, and I won't bore you with all of the details. Two important things to notice. When I look back, I realized that in 2018, 2019, we absorbed an IMI. And that's an IMI where the DMB invested us, investigated us, especially the banking activities. And we had to take a hit of 2.4%. If you now look at this and you look at the developments around COVID-19, you see that in a number of cases, it is said that trim, maybe we need to postpone it. But we've already included it. Realize that, please. In addition, the result of actively managing our activity makes that our CET1 at the end of the year end, especially at the end of this meeting, is 17.7%. So strong CET1, strong capital, and that's wonderful in the world of today. I said at the time that brings us to an ideal position to absorb Basel four, but again, that's shifting. So we prepared for everything, but everything is moving further down the line. No, nonetheless, our capital position is important and strong. That brings us to dividend. And the dividend slide is, in fact, the slide as you should have seen in a normal world. And in the normal world, it is shown that 
in 2019 and over 29, we can declare a dividend, dividend of 78 cents per share. But it also explains that the world has changed. So what we had to do consciously is the following, and I'll talk to you in more detail later. The next slide. Then medium-term objectives. As Paul said, 2019 is looking fantastic. But we had to, we issued a couple of press releases in respect of COVID-19. Let me start by saying this first. We are taking into account the recommendations of the ECB and the DMB. And NIBC has decided to pay the dividends for 2019 in the second half of 2020, but only if everybody is of the opinion that this payment is feasible and appropriate because of COVID-19 on the basis of the business as it is at the time. And that's an important statement, also looking at where we're at right now. At the same time, we can state this because our capital position is strong. I want to emphasize that too. Today, we issued a press, press release as well, because why wouldn't we say anything about medium-term objectives? So what was in the press release? COVID-19 has an adverse effect on our 2020 financial performance, but we are not capable right now to share the scope and how long this will last. So what exactly is the quantification of those effects? But we do foresee, and because of the target, that NIBC is dealing with as well the medium term objective, especially the ROI for 10, 12% for 2020 won't be feasible. And that's because of changed circumstances. If the circumstance circumstances change again, we go back to normal, we want to emphasize that NIBC still has the objective to meet our targets. So we are not giving up on our targets or our policies in that respect. Okay, slide. Brings me to the slide on COVID-19. As you have been seeing around us, it's especially the central banks, DNB and everybody, offer a lot of opportunities and possibilities to mitigate the circumstances, if you will, and uh, trying to support as many companies as we can. You see that in the field of funding, first of all. You also see that the ECB has a, an adjusted asset purchase program that they launched, and it offers the possibility to do a TL, TRO3, et cetera. And I think it's important that we realize that. At the same time, I also often hear that many measures are provided revolving capital. Of course, implementation of Basel IV is now delayed with the year. And at the same time, you see some other adjustments. And I do believe that we need to realize that these changes or adjustments do not lead to postponing or cancelling it altogether. So if you think that the ambition level of NIBC of 14%, a medium term objective that it could be less, we believe that we are not doing ourselves any favors because in the long run, we will have to get back to that. So we will do everything in our power to really achieve those goals. Of course, it does help to look at our credits, especially for our clients. Another aspect when it comes to funding profile, last year, we said that we were very active in changing our funding profile over the course of the year, and this had led to the situation that the funding profile indeed changed. We use our wholesale funding solely for long term, and long means two years sometimes, but that's really corporate side. The majority of our transaction is between six and ten years. And that really helps us at this moment, because if you look at this overview, of other secured funding, and looking at it, you see that 2020, 2021, we have to repay in those fields. It is all TL TROs. And the good thing about TL TRO3 is that 
uh, when it comes to two, uh, we can uh, transfer the almost 1.1 billion to TL TRO3 from two. And it means that funding on the wholesale line in the years 2021, 2020 is very limited. And that gives us a lot of time to breathe and some flexibility. And as an investor, that must put your minds at ease as well. If looking at today, and I can't say too much about today, but nevertheless, um, a sneak preview towards year end, 222% uh, projected LCR. And that is, of course, looking at the uh, short-term funding of the band at we already had a uh, 100 plus requirement but we have reduced that it can now be below 100 and for our bank and other banks in the Netherlands it's not a very pleasant situation to be in so we will not manage on getting below that um, 100 percent also a significant cash buffer so really cash that we have is more than 4.7 billion and also our liquidity buffer is 3.2, 3.3 billion. So all in all, this gives us a very solid liquidity. And that is the most important thing. And of course, a strong solvency is also very important. So that brings me to solvency. Next slide. As you can see, we have CET1, 17.7% and 10.5 SREP. That gives us a significant buffer. So if you are honest and you look at the buffer, I would really prefer to have it compared to our medium term objective of 14%. I'd rather have it closer um, so that means another buffer of 300 million plus, that would be more strong. So if you look at the temporary measures in place, possibly, and take those into account, then such a buffer is even substantially bigger from 10.5 to 8. And I don't think that's a desirable situation. Nobody can predict how Corona and COVID-19 will develop and how deep the dip is going to be. But it does give us some space to do the things that we have to do. Core capital is strong about, above our management target. And then I would like to come to a conclusion and I would like to give the floor back to the chair. So in summary, any NIBC is there for its people and clients and we take responsibility for our role in the economy that we operate in. We are well-funded with ample liquidity and a CET1 ratio of 17.7%, well above the required minimum levels and also well above our own ambitions. The COVID-19 outbreak is an extraordinary situation with both economic and health consequences and healthcare and systems in countries. And overall, we believe that we are well positioned and prepared with our people, with our expertise and resources and our professionalism to be able to weather this storm. And again, our CET1 will definitely help us here as well. Thank you very much. Paulus and Herman, many thanks for your updates and presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to slide number 30. And you see questions and answers. So this is the time for you to ask your questions. And if you'll allow me, I would like to start with the questions that were already sent to us in writing. And should there be any other questions that you wish to ask, please, you have already been informed how to do that through the operator. First question that I would like to discuss is the question of Mr. Pech. 
His question is, does NIBC have specific groups of clients in the portfolio that geographically or because of their activities are extra vulnerable in this time of crisis and that in the short term will require extra support from NIBC on top of the government support? So, and would that be a concern to NIBC? Can this lead to strategic changes for NIBC or is it too soon to tell? Of course, Mr. Becker in his question says, I'm not asking my question about individual clients, but that is probably obvious. And I would like to give Mr. DeVille the floor to answer this question. I would like to refer it to my colleague. Thank you, Mr. Becker, for this question. As we have said in our introduction, we are in touch with all our clients on an individual basis. That is the character and DNA of NIBC. And this is how we proceed. We look at each and individual client. So we look when we look at retail side, that's mortgages mainly, then I must say that we're doing quite well because we are closely monitoring the measures that have already been announced. We already talked about the three to six month grace period for people who need it. We do see an increased demand there, especially people who are self-employed, but still very modest when it comes to requests. Uh, bottom line, in the past, we already made certain choices to divest in shipping and energy uh, to reduce that type of um, investments. And we are in close contact with customers in those fields, whether they require our support and also related to the oil price and uh, looking at whether there is a loan restructuring required there and we are really keeping track of all these things but again for now it's very manageable thank you i'm now going to continue with the question of mr stevens his question is the following you have a request from the European Central Bank to not pay out dividend. Nevertheless, you have proposed a dividend and you are going to vote. But at earliest, you will pay out the dividend in the second half of this year and only if the impact of the coronavirus allows this. True. And this is also what we reiterated just now. And Mr. Dijkhuizen did that. So question is, who is going to get the dividend? And the answer, Mr. Stevens, of course, is that we will pay out dividend to existing shareholders. And that seems pretty obvious to me. Then another question, there is an offer of nine euro 85, including dividend that are not owned by DC Flowers and mm, so with the majority shareholders, there are separate agreements to buy shares from those. Uh, what are these agreements and why are you not putting it up for a vote? I would like to answer two things. A, we are not voting on this offer today because it's not on the agenda. And as indicated, we will have a separate extraordinary meeting of shareholder about the entire Blackstone offer, and we will discuss it then. Then, second of all, the agreements that Flowers and Venborg made with Blackstone, of course, are not on the agenda either. These agreements are private contracts with individual shareholders, and this is not something that is part of this meeting, and it's not something that we as managing board uh, deal with or are responsible for. 
Of course, suspending buyback of shares is something I understand. That's your following question. But um, paying our dividend, yes or no, has that, does that have an influence on the takeover offers? Uh, so you have a strong capital buffer. And at the latest 19th May, there has to be a, a submitting of for approval with the regulators. So you think that the transaction is going to be finalized somewhere in the second half of this year. I think that all these presumptions are uh, correct. We already talked about the 17.7 .7 number. And Mr. Dijkhuizen informed us about many of those figures. But to what extent certain matters are going to influence the takeover of her again is something that today we are not going to talk about. Um, the offer was cum dividend, by the way. So your third question, equity. 1.8 billion, which is 12 euro 32 per share. So you say it's below intrinsic. So your question is, why do majority shareholders agree with the price offered, whereas the actual value is much higher? Again, this is a matter of shareholders and not something that is on the agenda today. And in itself, this is something that we really leave with the shareholders. It's their responsibility and their choice uh, whether or not they want to offer their shares based on this uh, price, also majority shareholders. And we will not give any statements about that. The fourth question, you look at bonds and shares in the corporate market and you have to have a provision of 9 million compensated by strong operational profits in 2019. These activities are not profitable enough. Would you be able to invest in more profitable activities and uh, what percentage can we count on then? Um, will the cost ratio be reduced and the uh, capital ratio increased? I would like to uh, refer to Mr. Dijkhuizen for this. Mr. Stevens, thank you. If you look at the figures and our activities, yes, we have discontinued these activities. We, we, we didn't have many of them. We, we still have some loose ends that we need to tie. It means indeed that our costs will be reduced slightly in the light of the fact that we do not have these activities any longer. For your understanding, the Money that we're talking about is about 20 to 25 million, so it's not really a lot. So again, um, this is something that has been included in our medium term objectives from 10 to 12, right, that we refer to. So for medium term, we will measure everything against that. Thank you. I will now continue with the next question of Mr. Stevens. Can you please state? So the amount of euros in profit, profit reinvesting, what is the return? So again, I look at Mr. Dijkhuizen, and that's a question I asked uh, answered earlier. The hurdle is at 10 to 12. Thank you. That's clear. Question six, Oimio as a brand name for SME and bespoke loans, but the competition is increasing here and the regulatory bodies want better capital buffers for these kinds of special loans. Some of these products contain retail, uh, uh, commercial shopping real estate. Doesn't it make you vulnerable, the cooperation with the company on hold? Is it a sufficient return? And I look at Mr. Van Riel. Yes, thank you, Chair. And Mr. Stevens, again, everybody listening in. S separate elements I want to answer differently. The cooperation with Oimar, that is not about the return. That's about cooperation between management, and that cooperation works wonder wonderfully. We are capable 
to better provide insight in what's going on and that really benefits us right now in these uncertain times the second thing that you talked about is oimio included in the question uh, i want to clarify a couple of things oimio is about the provision of commercial lo real estate loans up to 10 million it is not a leveraged loan that's not what it is. That's not what we're doing there. We're also not talking about venture capitalists and the cooperation with them. We are talking about pre-selected investors, whether we can supply a service here. That's a label that we started up a couple of months ago and we thought about it extensively. And we are very selective when it comes to that. Now, the comments about uh, com uh, shopping, commercial estate for shops, we will take it into account. The team will only accept propositions in line with our normal way of thinking. These are good propositions. So if it fits our uh, business, we will think about it more seriously. Next question, what happens in Audible and Audible? So this question came up because the acquirer is an American private equity fund, Mr. Daghausen. This question makes me so happy, Mr. Stevens. And I really want to emphasize that nothing changes for deposit holders. And NIBC Bank, NV, is and remains subject to Dutch supervision. And that continues as usual. That means that all our deposit holders will be governed by the Dutch system for guaranteeing these deposits now and in the future. And I think that's very important to realize. Thank you. The, moving on. To the next set of questions and they were all asked about the Blackstone uh, acquisition. I will read out the questions but I am afraid that you can guess what my answer is going to be. Mr. Van Vuren, can you give us an update on the expected return on the Blackstone transaction? So the press release release on your website is four weeks old to only talks about the closing half 2020 that's broadly defined i can't wait about the conditions of the transactions and are they irrevocable so and i don't want your standard answer about regulators the transaction is it in any way dependent on an offer made to other shareholders too is it correct that there's a mat in it only NIBC related uh, issues or also market circumstances. So Corona, could it be a ground to invoke the MET? Or if you only talk about the exclusive factors, is it based on a certain ratio that perhaps the threshold could fall from underneath it? Or could you say that Blackstone can only step away from this deal if if there are any skeletons in the closet. If they show up, can Blackstone move away from this transaction? So basically, can, can they get out of it? And can we perhaps have those questions answered before the IPO, the public offer? Next question. In the February release, it says irrevocably regreed shareholders NRBC in English. With the offer at fixed prices per share, come dividend at Euro 8.93 per share for JCF and Euro 9.65 per share for Regeborg. I lees that as an. No. Irrevocably for Flora and. But is it also irrevocably for Blackstone once certain commissions conditions are met in English? 
dat de transactie inclusief de verkoop CCF aan Blackstone van tafel is als die offer niet unconditional wordt verklaard. En klopt het dat... En is het correct dat in dat case Blackstone can walk away from this deal despite uh, their offer made? So, if for example... If, for example, Blackstone stops to submit material in respect of the offer to the uh, supervisory uh, boards, regulators, etc. So, next question from the world. A, an offer is prefer, prepared for listed shares for this group. Apparently, there is an agreement between Blackstone and the two major shareholders, Flora and Regenborg. So the last press release is everything is operating as it should, but a month has passed since your last press release. So I would like to know, are we still uh, on schedule? And what is your idea about the closing and um, compliance with this offer? Now, to all of these questions, I simply repeat the answer given before, and that is the following. We cannot but refer to the press releases as disclosed on our website, the ones in February, the two in March, and we can't say anything else about this. We simply refer to those press releases. And again, any questions about the offer and uh, further information I simply refer to the extraordinary meeting of shareholders. And that is something that uh, Stevens said earlier. So regular time path, 10 to 12 weeks after the offer, that you need to have submitted your memorandum with the offer conditions to the AFM. And if you add 12 weeks to the offer made, then you arrive, and that's exact, as Stevenson said, 19 May. No. No further announcements will be made about this, so this is not public information. The AFM, within four to six weeks, will consent, approve the offer memo, and then you need to uh, open your offer because of, uh, by a disclosure. And any, we cannot make any further announcements about this, but we are working very hard towards just sticking to the timeline, going through all of the steps and um, stick to the timeline. So that's all we wanted to say about the questions submitted in writing beforehand. And the next step is me looking at the telephone line. Any questions coming in? And I also look at the secretary right now. So are the people on call who have questions about our answers, the earlier questions, the presentations, or further questions in whatever respect? Or make a contribution on today's call, please press star one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star two. You will be advised when to ask your question. In English. Jost Schmitz, please go ahead. Good, uh, Good morning. Chair Sluimers, the meeting. I'm Jorna of the VEB. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Jorna. Yes, it is about the consequences of the coronavirus and the outbreak. You talked about this extensively. What's your view? Can you perhaps quantify some of the effects in terms of the customers? How many of your customers were faced by uh, this? And did you waive any interest payments and any bankruptcy of uh, bankruptcies of customers? Any reports thereof? Second question of my organization is about the investment in a syntax startup. And yes, these types of parties have a liquidity uh, problem. Um, there is a technical glitch, and it's not the syntech, um, but the fintech parties. 
So, any adverse effects? Now, in respect of the offer, you mentioned a lot of things. Also, for the extraordinary meeting of shareholders, and I know that uh, you are referring to that meeting, but I have one question. We now see that the list, the, the price on the stock exchange is going down. The bottom is dropping out of it, and we don't know what's happening as an investor. So can we rely on the market? You probably know the conditions, and I... So the coronavirus and the consequences for NIBC, is it a disruption to such an extent that Blackstone, Blackstone can get out of the offer because of those circumstances? And that's a question that we have. And you referred to this earlier in your annual report, the VEB was talked about, the non-disclosure of the interests of Blackstone and late information of the market took a week. And many formulas shared. So Mr. De Weld talks about a claim of 3.7 million in damages suffered. Mr. De Weld says that claim is uh, without grounds. So what is your investigation? And on the basis of what investigation did you arrive at that conclusion? So a stronger market and a better list price is that a sufficient explanation? We don't think so. Did the AFM ask you for information? And don't you think that these kinds of cases are embarrassing for Kramers as a member of the advisory committee and supervisory board as well? And he's part of the AFM. Focus Wessers, Wessels saw themselves faced with this as well, and they settled. So wouldn't it be better for NIBC to settle as well? I mean, the burden of proof is on NIBC, and quite often it doesn't pay off to go to court about this. Now, you are uh, saying goodbye to your obligations, your emissions, and further types of investments of a similar nature. To what extent? And we understand why Blackstone is interested is in NIPC, especially when it comes to the mortgages and the corporate side of things. So Blackstone, did they actually exert an influence on this? Is that a correct assumption? Yes or no? Now, something that's very serious, um, we learned of this, NIBC, because of, uh, by the Court of North Holland in December 2019 was ordered on the basis of fraud, legacy, fraud, and that is a, a deadly sin for any kind of bank. So tone at the top, that is decisive here. So if this is the tone at the top, so the banking oath, can you actually uphold it in terms of your new employees? And this is damaging to the reputation of the banking sector. I mean, this is just people that are driven by greed. So dividends, preference shares, if you cover that and uh, hedge it, and no income in the Netherlands, and you're working together with Societe Generale, will you lodge an appeal? No. You uh, reached a settlement with the tax authorities. How much did you pay them? So the your next mistake then. Not your mistake, true, but it's embarrassing nonetheless. Before 29th of November, you could have filed an objections. And then a day after the disclosure, you find out suddenly that you were set back another step. Again, investors suffer. How did it come to this? This What's the mistake? What's the error in the organization of NIBC? Last but not least, the uh, IT platform. So you have a new partner. Is it still operational? And you are dealing with outsourcing. You have an external partner. You have three lines of defense in uh, respect of the CTK. And they outsourced it as well. 
So, remuneration and dividends. I am not quite sure. Maybe you want to shelf this for now and talk about the other things first? Mr. Yorna, my name is Mr. Yorna. I apologize. Let's park that question until we get to that item on the agenda. First question then, which was about the consequences of the coronavirus and the effect it has on clients, interest payments and possible bankruptcy. Looking at Mr. De Wild here. Of course, the numbers are more visible in the mortgage side compared to the corporate side, so that's much more limited. And if you look at the mortgage side, we are talking about a hundred clients who have found a way to contact us and request us to come to arrangement. So consider about that it that this is about one percent of our portfolio. I'd like to leave it at that. Mr. Yorna, no bankruptcies so far that you are aware of? No, Mr. Yorna, I am not aware until today that we have registered any bankruptcies related to Corona. And also from the retail side, I can tell you that. And on the corporate side, we are talking about less than a dozen situation coming to arrangements, adjusting the situations or conditions. So. Good, that's not too bad, Ms. Yona says. Your next question then, which also relates to possible damage for NIBC, about financing in financial uh, or uh, fintech or startups. Yes, Mr. Yorna, to be clear, we have a very modest portfolio when it comes to financing financial startups, you've been able to see that uh, there is one position what, which is uh, Ibery, our investment there. And as you know, Santander, first week of March, bought the first tier of shares. Um, Iberida, that is a transaction that we are aware of. We are not aware, however, of any effects on the entire transaction. I think this is the exact reason why Santander only took that one first tier. Regarding other investments, very modest investments, and that is the normal process, and I would like to leave it at that. Thank you. Let's move to HSA, Mr. De Wild. Maybe not the answer you're looking for, but we never address individual clients and Meta. It's normal process and the first update you will get is when we present our six month uh, update of way through the year. Fourth question. About the fact that share price is significantly below the offer of 9.85. And the question was, can Blackstone invoke, looking at the circumstances, the Mac clause? Looking at Mr. De Wild. Well, I can only follow our chair in the answer that was provided already. We will not disclose any information at this moment. We will not communicate because we're right in the middle of a transaction. And at the next opportune moment, we will address all matters dealing with Blackstone. Um, well, especially for the smaller investors, I must say that this will remain a big question mark as to how this deal has come about, what the details are, whether Blackstone will and can invoke 
um, clauses and whether the deal is irrevocable and whether Corona is at all one of the conditions that would apply to a contract and would trigger Blackstone. It's essential for the market to know these things. And are you then under or overestimating the chances if you are not aware of the conditions of this clause? Well, the only thing I can do is reiterate what I've said. We have public announcements that we had. We have press releases that we have at three different moments, and we were very clear in stating that the transaction was on track. And we are all working on this transaction, and more than that is not something we are going to disclose today. I can only refer you to the next special dedicated meeting. Yes, but, but that will only be in the second half of 2020. So you leave us hanging. We would like to have a level playing field for all parties and we follow the rules that come with these types of transactions. Well, that is something I regret very much. Yes, Mr. Yorna, and I also said I would like to refer to also the questions of Mr. Stevens that on the 19th of May, which is 12 weeks after the offer, then the offer memorandum has to be with the AFM, with the uh, regulator, and then another week and then um, the offer will be public. Yes, I am aware of these terms, but that is still very long for investors who are having to deal with these types of insecure situations. Your letter that you sent, we, of course, uh, extensively answered everything addressed in your letter, and that answer is... Uh, now with BEB and the general contents of the letter is that those who uh, put up a certain method, they will have to prove. And uh, to be honest, it did not become clear to us as to how exactly and in what manner uh, the VEB seems to be able to prove all of that. So the request in the letter from us to VEB is whether you can come up with any information and facts that substantiate your statement. And on that letter, Mr. Yorna, we did not receive an answer yet. So um, we have a letter that is in your possession. So once you give us an answer and substantiate your statement, we will be able to go into what you're saying. Well, then I probably need to help you out here. It is not to an extent that if you conclude that trading volumes are significantly different without any reason, and you see things going up, that all of a sudden burden of proof is with the plaintiff. NIBC needs to prove that you have done everything in your power looking at the consequences for share price and volume and you did not do that. You should have realized as well that Blackstone was already negotiating with two major shareholders and also from that perspective you weren't able to guarantee. So burden of proof legal, from the legal perspective is entirely with you. So if it comes to a court case, you will have burden of proof. And there is ample case law that says that burden of proof lies with NIBC. And maybe you can't and you will be ordered to pay damages. So this is why we called upon you to come up with an arrangement. You understand that if we give you an extensive written statement that the least that we expect is a formal response from your side again. And we did not receive such a formal response from your side. So we are waiting for that. Well, I think my colleagues are working on that. But um, this is why I actually wanted to address this issue. And apparently your answer is this. But Mr. The Wild is using unfounded 
in an interview that he gave to a client. And when he says it's unfounded, then we want to know in this meeting as to how he got to the conclusion, uh, sorry, that these statements were unfounded. Well, I would like to refer to the beginning of my answer that someone who gives a statement will need to substantiate the statement. And like our legal counsel has said, we believe that your statement was unfounded or unsubstantiated. I'm sorry. Yes, you are very free to respond again and again. Our letter, of course, this is a legal matter. You and I, you and me, we, we both know that. We will wait for the official and formal response from VEB, and I'm very happy to hear that also people in VEB are now working on that. Well, in the future, let's uh, see how it plays out, and we will meet again in better circumstances, and hopefully the virus is behind us. Let's just hope so. Absolutely, thank you. We will look at your next question, which was a question in which you said, is it true that in discontinuing the activities in financial market, Blackstone in the background was already having an influence there? The simple answer is no. These are two completely separate matters. All right. Then you also asked questions about a legal proceeding ongoing, a possible deal with the tax administration. And now looking at Mr. Dijkhuis, whether he can answer. Yes, I can provide you with an answer. I would like to stress that NIBC is not a party in this case. So I cannot give you any details on the contents. Uh, Mr. Jorn, I would like to finish my uh, answer here. Thank you. The transaction structure we are aware of because uh, there is no difference in opinion between uh, the tax administration and how we look at it. So in the final settlement, there is an arrangement between NIBC and um, the tax administration, it considers different years. In response to that, go ahead, Mr. Jorna. The court of North Holland was very clear in mentioning NIBC. There was a joint venture between NIBC and Société Générale, and NIBC had a stake of 5% in it. Uh, but shared for 50% in the profits of that. Is that correct? Because you're saying that NIBC is not a party to the court case? Or am I now seeing things in a different daylight? We settled this case in the past with the tax authorities, and it's very important to me that I outline the context, because you're now suggesting that this is a very recent case, but this is... Uh, a court case way before my time and Mr. De Wilt's time here, and we settled things very decently with the tax authorities. And looking at um, the regulators, we reported all of this. We did not claim anything. The other party was the plaintiff or the claimant. I can't speak on their behalf. And we, of course, reported this uh, as we should have to the DNB. Can you give a year? It We would like to refer to the year 2006 when it comes to this. So this is when the entire court case was started, right? It was not my intention, by the way, to accuse Mr. De Wild or you or involve you in any way. Uh, it was just something of a signal that a court in North Holland in September 2019 sought that publicity and, of course, explicitly mentioning NIBC somewhere. So uh, in that light, this is not good for your image. 
um, when it comes to ethical banker banking. Mr. Yorna, I do understand that. We were mentioned. Um, we were not a party. We were mentioned in the transaction, and we did everything that was required of us compared to the tax authorities. We have an excellent relationship with the tax authorities, and I can tell you that ever since we have applied a horizontal um, supervision, um, we are doing everything according to the books. And before that, I don't know, and I, I can't tell you. Well, normally I'd say, let's talk over a drink afterwards, but we can't do that. But I highly value uh, you giving me the opportunity to talk about this. So, yes, let's leave this behind us then. Thank you. Uh, right. Thank you. But thank you again for asking those questions. And I think it's a good thing for all the other participants to this meeting to have clarity in this area because we shouldn't just uh, let go of certain things or not talk about certain things if we are litigating and if we are we're, uh, mentioned in proceedings, even though we're not party to it, we should be able to talk about it. 29 November last year then, to what extent? We were or were not changed in this indices at Euronext. And I'm looking at Mr. De Wild. Well, I ca can't add a whole lot. It resulted in uh, misunderstandings and those have been remedied and corrected. This answer, no, that's too brief an answer, Mr. De Wild, in my opinion. Euronext. has an announcement. This is what we're going to do. Parties were given the opportunity to respond. And IBC does not respond. And then after effectuation, it seems they finally woke up. So how come you weren't alert? Why? How come you didn't contact your next? Well, it was a misunderstanding on both sides. It wasn't clear who was supposed to respond to what. This was the result, and the decision had been taken already. Before 29 November, did you talk to Euronext? Any type of contact? The exact details? I don't want to comment on it. There was a misunderstanding on both parties on the communications, and unfortunately, that results in this debate right now. But in the event of misunderstandings, you must have communicated, and I was under the impression you did nothing whatsoever. You just let it happen to you. Then you talked later. Then you made it clear that you had free floats of 25%, and your next didn't take that as a basis. Your words, Mr. Yornam. Well, that's why I'm asking. That's why I'm asking. Before 29 November, prior to the date, had, did you have contact? Then we can talk about a misunderstanding. Were you in contact with them prior to 29 November of last year? It's a simple yes, no question. As far as I know, no. Because there was no reason for us. And our free float, as you said, was more than uh, known to all parties, and that resulted in a misunderstanding. Mr. Yorna, Mr. Yorna, of course there was not a change of a free float. In fact, Yorna, that's not the point, but in the index, you were set back. You were placed in a different position, and many parties cannot trade in the, the lower index, uh, the index that you were in. And that, therefore, results in damage, a loss to investors. So, Mr. De Wilt, you're taking shortcuts here. And IBC was asleep at the wheel, in my experience. And not until the decision became final, finally you realize, oh, dear, that's not possible. Your next made a mistake. That's fine. No problem. But then the damage had been occurred, had been incurred, and, and that was the end of it all. Again, I can repeat my answer, but I won't. We regret how this happened. And we are happy that we are now part of the correct index once again. May I please leave it at that for now? And can I please proceed to your next question about the IT platform? Right. 
So I read what you said about this, or I listened to what you said about it. We are very happy with our change to Africa that was completely completed in June of July uh, 2019. And then we did fine tuning after that. And right now, everything works as it should. It runs very smoothly. And that is outstanding as far as we're concerned. No problem whatsoever during our tests. And not even when we worked from home, no problems. Of course, we're continuously monitoring with the company concerned what kind of business need to be addressed. And that is in the management letter of the auditor. And I will get questions about it later. It literally says, pay attention to your IT. And we are tightening up procedures when we can. With Citega, because that's quite often the problem, uh, when you're talking about a line of defense, if Citega outsources, then you need to check this carefully within Citega, within your own in-control statement relates to it. So it, there, parties that they use for the services. Are you in control of them? And what do you do? Yes, we stay on top of things and we have processes for this. What you're now looking at, Serica, but there are other companies I can refer to and talk about. So we have ESA reports, etc., etc. Oh, All right, I'm familiar with them, but again, good question. Mr. Yorana, thank you very much. Are there any more questions that uh, that are being asked? We have a question coming from Sandra Heyer. Okay. Please go ahead. Good morning, Sandra Heyer. I have a question. On the repurchase of shares, the buyback of shares, is this the right time to ask that question? No. Hold on. And let's wait till we talking till we are talking about that item on the agenda. That's fine, that's not a problem. Right. We're really talking about the board uh, the management board's report. Any other questions about the report of the management board? So the report, the presentation, I'm asking the operator that question. Any incoming questions? If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your keypad now. Um, so if there are no further questions, I would like to proceed and move on to, to B, and that is the uh, report of the supervisory board. And for this topic, I refer to the annual report, pages 106 to 115. We don't have any specific explanation. But, of course, feel free to ask any questions or to comment on this. And let me confer with the operator. Are there any questions coming in? We're talking on 2B of the agenda, item 2B on the agenda. No questions coming through. Right. Moving on to to see on the agenda, and I refer to pages 118 to 122 of the annual report. Any questions or comments on? No questions coming through. Okay. Again, moving on. Now, for this topic, I refer to the annual report, pages 110 to 129. Any questions or comments, perhaps? Okay. 
And I think it's you, Mr. Yorna. Yes, absolutely it is. And of course, the operator refers to you to Joost Smith. So sometimes it's confusing, but we know it's you, Mr. Yorna. Chair, the variable remuneration, you're terminating it and you're converting it into a fixed salary. We believe that's a good thing. You take the average of 2017 to 2019 and at a 60% increase of your fixed salary component. We're happy about that. That's fine. But we have a question about this. The supervisory board, did they realize that these were the best years of NIBC and maybe they're meager years ahead of us? This is an irreversible process and it's difficult to adjust later on because it's difficult to reduce a fixed salary component. And IBC, because of the special circumstances going on right now, and the ECB, are you considering not paying a bonus? And if you did not consider that, why not? Thank you. It, hopefully, Ms. Zeilefeld is here. She's the chair of the remuneration committee. She is on call. Hopefully, perhaps I can give the floor to her. Thank you, chair. Yes, this is Zeilefeld. Yes, we regularly review our remuneration policy and ongoing developments. And I am glad that you are happy with the conversion of remu uh, variable to fix. Yes, the past years were fantastic years. But this was a process that was started early on. We started this process last year and we did this across the board throughout the organization. And our proposal is generated by a basic principle. And that basic principle doesn't change because of our current situation that we find ourselves in. So last year, we talked with the Works Council to discuss this. And as said, it was across the board for all of the employees implemented 20 December. The Works Council gave us their consent and early in January, we communicated this to our staff. And as the supervisory board, we value consistency. When we start something, we want to bring it to completion. And that, in brief, will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yorna. Well, that's fine. Thank you. And what about the bonuses? Excuse me? Well, are you going to pay a bonus, yea or nay? That's a question. And on call, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Beilefeld. Yes, I'm still on call. Uh, the bonuses, payment, yea or nay. As I said earlier, the major banks in the Netherlands over the past years got rid of bonuses. As said, we applied the same principle for our staff. The bonuses in the Netherlands are up to a maximum of 20%. Now, if you look at this tool and the effectivity and the efforts that you need to pay that bonuses, well, we lost our belief in the tool. The principle for changing this converting this into fixed salary, that principle stays the same. And the raw food uh, recommendation, we took the three years, a discount of 68%. So we believe that we are well in line with this. Chair, this is not entirely my question. My question is not answered. May I please rephrase my question? We have Corona going on right now. The ECB made it very clear, do not pay a dividend right now. Do not pay bonuses to uh, members of the board right now. Here's my question, NIBC, why did you consider not paying the bonus? Why did you not consider not paying the bonus? So what the ECB did, is do not pay bonuses. But if you look abroad, 
Bonuses can be 100% of the base salary. Completely different situation compared to the situation in the Netherlands. As I said earlier, we believe this is in line with what's customary. Convert a bonus to a fixed salary component. And that's in line with what is demanded of us. Mr. Jorna, that's correct for 2020, but I'm talking about 2019, the payment of the bonuses for that year. And I am not sure what ING is doing or ABN. I didn't uh, look at their report yet. Well, if you look at the excellent years, the excellent past year, and the efforts made in the past year. Of course, we had the debate together, and we see no reason to do things differently. Mr. Jorna, but you're postponing your dividend to the second half of the year. Then you're heeding the call of the ECB. Make sure you have money at hand. The ECB is also asking, because of Corona, I'm not saying that 2019 the gentlemen underperformed or that they are not deserving of their bonus, but because of Corona, the ECB is asking banks to keep the money in the tiller. So, converting to a fixed salary, difficult, and so on and so forth, but the special remuneration for 2019, there's no reason not to postpone. Well, I believe that the situation here in this country is, is different than the ones abroad. We're not talking about substantial amounts here. Well, the ECB didn't make a, a, an exception for the Netherlands. They asked banks to please sit on the money for a while. Mr. Jorna, perhaps it would be good to realize the following. ECB asked European banks to adopt a reserved approach. So if you pay bonuses, Please be modest. Please don't overdo it. And what Mr. Zeideveld points out, that in view of the fact that here in the Netherlands, and we already are uh, different in your, the Netherlands, we are in an exceptional position. Our maximum is 20% of the base salary. So de facto, we are already very prudent and modest when it comes to paying uh, the bonuses. So we are very moderate. And for the periods after 2019, we're getting rid of the bonus system. And that is a very moderate and humble approach. And I believe that in the debate that we had within the supervisory board and elsewhere, we believe that our approach makes us act in uh, line with the advice of the ECB. We are moderate. We are adopting a reserved approach. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Right, then the directive of the EU, it is very important that we now require an advisory vote from the shareholders. Um, what percentage of shareholders has voted in favor? Ms. von Rosenau. Thank you, Chair. The advisory vote represent 98% of the votes present in this meeting. Were you able to hear me? Yes, thank you. Which means that at least, that this is at least 98%. Because when it comes to an actual vote, we will ask everybody to vote and we will have the exact percentages that we hear from Our notary. Then brings me to item three on the agenda, which is the proposal to the to adopt the 2019 financial statements. I would like to give the floor to Ms. Zaina Ahmed Karim, and she is our accountant from Ernst and Young. Zaina, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I would like to use this opportunity to um, talk about what we do as an accountant for NIBC. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zaina Ahmed. Me and my team 
have been the external accountant for NIBC. And before this general meeting, I have signed a confidentiality clause, and this is what authorizes me to enlighten you today. Certain subjects that I would like to talk about, and you see all of it on slide two, to start with the scope of our audit. Brings me to slide three, scope. To the left, you see the objects that fall under the scope mentioned. So we have the consolidated uh, balance and also we looked at whether it all met the legal requirement, whether the annual accounts match the consolidating um, annual accounts and whether it matches our findings within um, an IBC. And th this matches all the legal requirements. Also the company gave us the order to report to DNB to assess the six month figure and of course giving our unqualified opinion and also giving advice on transactions. We are the end responsible ones uh, for the audit. I have a team of experts that supports me with know-how in the field. We have accountants and auditors in Netherlands and Germany and we have experts in the field of taxes and innovation technology. And also I used subject experts when it comes to evaluation of collateral and financial instrument and also assumptions when it comes to provisions for credit losses. Also, I have forensic accountants in my team to support the risk identification and of course executing the actual audit activities in the field of fraud and compliance with the environment. Of course, the scope of our activities in this field is unchanged compared to last year, based on the expectations of, uh, of course, uh, the subject of non-compliance and fraud is more specifically mentioned in our in-control statement in that particular paragraph that relates to that. The audit is aimed at providing the highest level of security and confidence, and it means that the uh, annual accounts have to be drafted according to the standards and cannot show any material deviations, and our process is to the extent that we can actually discover those deviations. Materiality is indicated and is different for all different items on the balance. We have different materialities. For example, when it comes to remuneration of board members, we have smaller deviations that we accept. The materiality that we accept in a consolidated account, it's 12 million. Any deviation above this amount could give rise to an extra investigation and can influence that. And um, so we can now safely say that everything has been found in accordance, otherwise we could never have given our unqualified opinion. So all deviations above 600,000 are actually reported to the supervisory board. So based on that materiality and the risk assessment, we executed our investigations. The audit took place mainly in the Netherlands. We sent out instructions to our German colleagues to conduct specific audits on specific activities. As an external accountant, we were able to look at 100% of assets. That brings me to slide four. We were able to give our unqualified auditors opinion that was included in the annual accounts, and we have sufficient proof to be able to give such a statement. It means that the consolidated balance in accordance with IFRS as allowed by the EU, and it gives a true picture and also the company balance also gives a good 
picture of how the company is doing. It's a true and fair view. And is in compliance with our audit goals. And the annual report complies with the demands on financial requirements and diversity and also remuneration report. The management of NIBC has drafted everything based on continuity and we looked at liquidity and solvency positions. We did not find any irregularities or insecurities that give rise to uh, any concerns. In our statement, we report two key audit matters, provision for credit losses and continuity and reliability of the automated data processing. In our statement, we address key audit matters and wherever possible, we refer to the relevant section of the annual accounts of NIBC. Then some remarks about COVID-19. The annual accounts of NIBC were drafted before the crisis hit us. It is an event after balance date that has no influence on the situation as per balance date. In our statement, it will have no influence, but we stayed in close touch with the management board. We did not conduct any other audits after this date. However, we did discuss the management board with the management board, the liquidity and continuity of the organization. No adjustments were made in the annual accounts because there was no discussion on discontinuity. Auditing the annual accounts is a process. At the beginning of this process, we draft a plan and of course at the end we draft a management letter. It contains recommendations to the management and the supervisory board. And in our report we look at detailed decisions and also we look at the legal requirements for any accountant's report. We have to address issues of continuity and automated data, automated data processing. We talk to the audit committee, the supervisory board and the management board. And we have periodical meetings with all three bodies and all of them have been very interested in our findings. We talk to several departments within NIBC. The relationship with the company is very tr transparent, critical, independent and good. Many departments strive for high quality and professionalism and we feel that we are taking very seriously and that our recommendations are adequately followed. I would like to thank you for your attention and I would like to give the floor back to the chat. Zaina, veel dank. Zaina, thank you very much for your presentation. And then, of course, the question to the participants in this meeting. At this moment, do you have a question or a remark? Are there any questions from um, the members of this meeting? Thank you. Question coming through from the line of Mr. Joost Schmidt. Please go ahead. Mr. Jorna, go ahead. Question to the accountant. There was a lot to do about the accountant's audit in collaboration with the audit committee. There was a lot of pressure from the DNB to uh, look at the level of the audit committee and make it sufficient when it comes to uh, know-how and expertise. The question to the accountant is, what is her assessment of the level of the audit committee um, as, as far as their know-how and expertise go? How, how, how did she experience that? Zaina, go ahead. Zaina, are you there? Are 
I muted myself, I'm sorry. So when we conducted our activities, we regularly spoke to the supervisory board, also uh, uh, with the presence of the managing board. We read minutes of the supervisory board, also the audit committee, making sure that we are informed about all subjects that were discussed and that were on the agenda, and also meetings we attend ourselves in person. And in person, and our experience is that the supervisory board is critical and asks the right questions when it comes to reporting and also in relation to operational and strategic goals. And I think the supervisory report board reported uh, on that in the annual report, and I think it is uh, complete in line with all of the things that we were able to experience. Yes, but my question isn't whether they are involved and whether they ask questions. Of course they do. But there is a lot of pressure from the DNB on making sure that an audit committee has the right level of understanding for the work they have to do. And my question is, do they have the right level of understanding? I do believe that in answering these, or in, in giving my answer, I did answer that question based on what I have experienced and what I have seen. I can only conclude that I feel that there is sufficient know-how with the audit committee. That is a nice answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your question and thank you for the answer. I am now looking at the operator. Are there any more questions on this item? We have no further question. As a quick reminder, please press star one on your keypad if you would like to ask a question. All right. Thank you. Um, because there are no further questions or no further comments, I propose to actually vote on this item on the agenda. And here's my question to Ms. Rosendahl. What percentage of the shares are voting in favor of this uh, proposal? Thank you, Chair. So vote in favor, represented by me, is 99% of the votes present during this meeting. Inaudible, but 99%. Thank you. I observe that the resolution has been adopted by the general meeting of shareholders because we did have the required majority of votes. And we will give you the exact percentage later. Moving on to 3B, and that is the proposal about the total dividend of 78 shares per ordinary share. And for this uh, topic, I refer to what Mr. Dijkhuizen said earlier during his presentation, and that was in respect of the dividend. Is there anybody out there who has questions or comments about this proposal? Again, asking the operator any questions on this item, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. We listened and we heard about NIBC's policies for the second half year. That's about the payment, um, if it's appropriate at the time. Now, I don't know to what extent, well, if we vote about this dividend right now, to what may be a suspension, but what about no payment whatsoever? If we agree to a suspension of payment, could it result in the dividend not being paid at all? And if we suspend or whatever, what kind of measures you're going to take for the second half of the year, how does it affect and what role does Blackstone play in this and that offer? How does it all come together? Mr. Dijkhuis and Mr. Jorna, thank you for your question. I refer to my earlier statement. We will make a payment if it's appropriate, if it's feasible in light of COVID-19. That's all I can say about it. If it's not feasible, if it's 
not appropriate, then we have a completely different world. But I cannot oversee the consequences, and Blackstone does not influence this. We will take our own decisions as the uh, board of management and the supervisory board, and that's our responsibility, and we will take it. Chair, I understand Dijkhuizen's antwoord answer, but technically speaking, if a shareholders meeting right now adopts a dividend, approves of a dividend, and for example, there's no money to make that payment when the time comes. We talked about the suspension, right? It cannot result in there being no payment whatsoever. Does that mean, does it mean that, that I'm a miss here, that I don't understand? So what you're saying is that you suspend theoretically to whatever year, could be any time, right? But you have to pay. So it is possible to postpone, but it's not possible to not pay at all. Well, we need to have that legally checked. As far as I'm concerned, you will have a postponement indefinitely. All right, I think we're on the same page. Thank you for your answer. All right. Again, asking the operator, any further questions on this item? Thank you, no further questions. Now, because there are no further questions or comments, nobody wants to take the floor, I propose to vote on this item. And again, Ms. Rosendahl, what percentage of the shareholders voted in favor of this resolution? Thank you, Chair. Vote in favor, and represented by me, 99% of the votes present during this meeting. Thank you. So I conclude that the resolution has been adopted by majority of vote during this general meeting of shareholders. Moving on to the proposal to discharge the uh, Board of Management. So. Anybody, any questions or comments on this item of the agenda? There are no questions. Thank you. So again, I propose to vote on this item. Ms. Rosendahl, may I please ask you what percentage of the uh, shares are voting in favor? The votes represented by me and in favor is 99 percent thank you so i conclude that the resolution has been adopt adopted by the majority of votes during this general meeting of shareholders 4b and that's the proposal to discharge the members of the supervisory board again question any questions or comments on this item of the agenda i Ask the operator. There are no questions coming through. So again, I propose to vote on this item of the agenda. Ms. Rosendahl, what percentage of the shareholders have voted in favor? Again, 99% of the votes that I represent during this meeting. Thank you. So I conclude that the resolution has been ad adopted by majority of vote during this meeting. Number five, the proposal to amend the remuneration policy of the members of the managing board. And I refer to the remuneration policy for the supervisory board, board and uh, the explanatory notes were added to the agenda. I simply refer to that. The proposal is to have an annual adjustment of the salary with a percentage that equals the average salary increase of all NIBC staff over the past three years. And I want to state that this adjustment also applies to the super supervisory board members as per the 1st of January 2019. So it happened last year. Then it is proposed, and we had the debate earlier together with Mr. Joyner, 
to get rid of the variable remuneration and to partially convert it for a percentage of 68 to a fixed salary. And that proposal is a line of the pressure by society and other stakeholders to do so. So the proposal is to take the salary over the past three years, the remuneration over the past three years and convert it into a fixed salary. And the same factor is um, applicable to all of these staff. So the method for the supervisory board, the board of management is the same as for all these staff. Now, anybody, any questions here? Any comments, operator? We have no questions coming through. We have no questions coming through, the operator said. So if there are no further questions, no comments, then I propose to vote on the item. Ms. Rosendahl, again, what percentage of the shares that you represent voted in favor? 92% of the votes I represent present during this meeting voted in favor of this proposal. I thank you and I conclude that the resolution has been adopted by a majority of votes during this meeting. And the uh, majority required is not just the 50% plus one. According to the shareholder rights directive, an advisory opinion requires a 75% majority. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, and that's the composition of the supervisory board. As you know, my appointment term is expiring at the end of this meeting, as said in the notice convening this meeting. So the supervisory board proposed to reappoint me. So I already received the consent of the necessary uh, persons and also the works council agreed but before we get to this and that brings me to item 6a on the agenda before we vote on this intended reappointment the meeting will be given the opportunity the opportunity to nominate other candidates for this vacancy or this position. And I hereby give the general meeting of shareholders the opportunity to make such a nominating nomination. No question on the proposal, thank you. I conclude therefore that the AGM did not make any recommendation in this respect. Uh, then moving on to item 6B on the agenda, and that is the proposal to reappoint of my own person as a member of the supervisory board. A member of the supervisory board, I want to emphasize because a chair is never appointed, that is uh, the discretion of the supervisory board. Any questions, any comments? We have no questions coming through. Okay, done. No questions coming through, thank you for that. And that means if there are no further questions or comments, we can vote on the proposal uh, put forward by the supervisory board, Ms. Rosendahl. Could you please give me the percentage of the shares, uh, shareholders voting in favor? Yes, I can. I represent 99% of the vote uh, cast in favor for this rep, uh, resolution present during this meeting as well. Thank you. So I conclude that this resolution has been adopted by the required majority of votes by the AGM. Moving on to item seven on the agenda, and that's the intention to reappoint Mr. Van Riel as a member of the managing board. 15 August 2016, Mr. Van Riel was appointed as a member of the managing board and CRO for a period of four years. The supervisory board wants to reappoint as per August 20. Uh, 
20 for another period of five years as CRO. Any remarks, any questions? We have no questions. Right, thank you. Mr. Van Riel, congratulations with your new term of four years. Brings me to item eight of the uh, on the agenda, issuance and repurchase of shares. And then first of all is the proposal to authorize the management board to issue shares under the conditions mentioned which is page 55 on screen right now. Does anybody have a question or a remark regarding this item? Good afternoon, Chair. Then I am now ready for my question that I intended to ask earlier. So in a case of a repurchase, are you bound in any way to a certain uh, non-trading term in relation to Blackstone? And should repurchases be required? How often and how fast do you need to report on that after these repurchasing transactions? And when would that start after it is proposed? This is an interesting question, but I have to be honest that we are here and we can look at each other. And I have the impression that we can't answer straight away. So I would like to suggest to you that we give you our answer in writing. Yes, that is fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, under this item, any other remarks or questions? If not, again, we will provide you the answer in writing and also attach it to the minutes of this meeting for your information. So, if we have no further questions or remarks i would like to propose to vote and ms rosendahl to state the percentages thank you chair again 97 percent of votes present in this meeting are in favor Thank you for that statement. I conclude that the proposal has been adopted with required majority. Brings me to 8B. Proposal to authorize the managing board to restrict or exclude preemptive rights as listed on under 8A. Does anybody have questions or remarks under this item? Of the agenda. So no further questions. I would like to propose to start the vote. Ms. Rosendahl, can I ask you again to state the percentage of voters in favor? Again, 97% in favor. Thank you. I conclude that this proposal has been adopted with a majority of votes by this meeting. 8C, then, the proposal to authorize the managing board to repurchase shares under the conditions mentioned on screen. And these conditions are listed on page 58 
of the presentation. Any questions or remarks related to this item on the agenda? Geen vragen, dank u wel. No questions, thank you. If nobody wishes to speak, then I would like to vote. And Ms. Rosendahl, again, I would like you to state the percentage in favor. Ninety-nine percent of votes represented. So in favor, ninety-nine percent. Thank you. I conclude again that this proposal has been adopted with the required majority of votes. Brings me to item nine on the agenda, which is the proposal to reappoint EY as auditor for the financial year 2020, referring to the reasons of reappointment as mentioned in the convocation and also on the screen. Does anybody wish to ask a question or make a remark? Thank you. Miss Rosendahl, then, please state the percentage of votes in favour. Percentage of vote in favour to reappoint EY as auditor for the financial year 2020. Votes in favour that I represent is again 99% of votes present in this meeting. Thank you. Then I conclude that this proposal has been adopted with the required majority. Brings me to any other business, which is the end of the meeting. I would like to give all people attending to ask questions that might not be directly related to an agenda item. I have a question about a part of the annual report that talks about transactions with third parties. It was something I noticed. NIBC was involved in a takeover of Wegenborg by Volker Vessels and 200 million was made available in the light of financing. So uh, what is your view on this transaction? Would you say this poses a conflict of interest or is this as a normal, was this a normal transaction regardless of the fact that we are major shareholders and what about the rates that were charged? Mr. Jorna, thank you for your question. As you have been able to see both in the annual report and in the presentation, we talked about the exposures and we disclosed explicitly the exposures in Bergenborg versus Volker Vessels, because rightly so, 200 million is not very common. It came to us in, under full business terms, and in the one of the committee of the super, supervisory board, we discussed this case, and um, we found it a good transaction, and I can disclose all of it. So... We were in competition with other banks, actually, and we looked at whether it would be uh, a risk that we wanted to take for remuneration reasons and conflict of interest reasons. There uh, was no issue, not from Wegeborg or any other party who collaborated in this transaction. And again, yes, it's a special situation. It was a special transaction. And Volker Wessels was then delisted. And within a fair term 
this will be paid back. These loans will be paid back. Thank you. Under any other business, any remaining questions by any of the attendees? If there are no further questions or remarks, ladies and gentlemen, that then brings us to the end of this meeting. I would like to ask you to please send in your voting uh, notes directly to Ms. Janssen. I would like to thank you for your participation today, for your questions, your involvement in this meeting. I am very well aware, just like all the others present here in this room, that this was a remote meeting. It doesn't always make it easy. We don't see each other and we really can't connect. And like Mr. Yorna said, we can't have a drink afterwards either, unfortunately. So it is not what we want. Nevertheless, we were very happy that you joined us and I will wish you a great weekend and please stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining today's call. You may now disconnect. Hosts, please stay on the line and await for further instructions. Uh,